Spirituality. What the Bible says, spirituality and fantasy, spirituality and reality. The Bible and spirituality. Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We're not just fighting other people, we're fighting evil in a much larger form, a form that we can barely begin to describe. Evil is not just ISIS, they're not just Hamas or a, a terrorist organization or Germans or the Russians or whoever you think your opponents are. It's much bigger than that. There are bigger forces at work. Evil, which does not take the form of man often, but which does use men to do what they want. Deuteronomy 18.10-12 through 12, There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering. Why would anyone do that? You know, that that's, that's a question that probably a few people have. Usually for fertility. You know, good crops or uh, so you could have lots of kids. You'd kill your own kids to do that. And people get mad because, well... Isaac was going to be sacrificed by Abraham to God. There were people burning their children alive, and, and we were going to get mad that a father wanted to follow God, and then and his son was like, yeah, I'm fine with it. Go ahead. I mean, Isaac was bound willingly. He said, yes, if this is what God will have you do, then do it. It wasn't like the binding of Isaac, the video game, where Isaac's mom is a total whack job, and she's like, must murder him. He's like, no! Isaac told Abraham it was okay. He believed in his father, and his father believed in God, and God stopped it all before it happened. Anyone who practices divination, or tells fortunes, or interprets omens, tarot cards, you know, mystical psychics, all of those. Uh, Saul went to consult a medium before battle. That was one of the many sins he committed. But God says don't. Or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination. I'm going to stop on that. Abomination, what does that mean? An abomination isn't just something that's bad. It's not just a bad person or a person I'm displeased with. It is an, ad an abhorrence to God. It's, it's not just, it's pretty bad, or it's really bad. It is such an affront to God that it's not even funny. It would be like going up to a Holocaust victim and, you know, throwing a bunch of Nazi propaganda at them and waving around a Nazi flag and reciting all of this Nazi lyrics and everything to them. And even worse, it is like an abhorrence up a notch. It's not just pretty bad, it's, it's like beyond belief bad. It is so bad that it is an absolute affront to who God is and to him. So, do you really want to invite that? That's, that's very, very much a bad place to be. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. The people in the lands, Canaan and all of that, the Canaanites, the Amorites, the all the ites, they were practicing things like this, killing their children, burning them to their gods, inquiring of the dead, practicing necromancy, charmers and sorcery, interpreting omens, telling fortunes and practicing divinations. All of these were being practiced by... These were people, that was their culture. 
I mean, these, these people were living the life of this. And people say there's no reason for them to go to war, to kill all of these people. But these people had dug their own graves long ago. They had a choice, and they chose death. Choose this day, life or death. They chose death. They chose to say, screw God, screw the rules, we're practicing necromancy. Just say no to necromancy. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6, there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. So, looking at that at least, that's saying that God gives gifts to people, and it all goes back to him. Whether you use those gifts for good or for evil, that's up to you. But ultimately, those gifts go back to God. And they are involved in numerous amounts. Just because you can't move mountains with your mind doesn't mean that other people can't. I mean, there might be people out there who can do things way beyond your belief. All those people who are like, well, you know, faith, healing, all of that, that's absolute sham. Sometimes it might be. And, you know, if if you're bleeding out or something, I'm not, or you're, kids really sick i'm not going to say don't inquire of a doctor or try to get help because if god wants to heal them he'll absolutely heal them before you need to either see a doctor or before you know it gets to a bad point but don't just say well we believe in god and then do nothing now there's a quote out there that a lot of if you look it up a bunch of christians are like oh it's absolute it They'll say a bunch of stupid things about it. But I believe a 100%. I, I think it's an absolutely great quote. The Lord helps those who help themselves. Meaning, if you want God to do something for you, you got to take, be willing to take care of things yourself. You know, if you want God to save, you know, unbelievers, then you got to be willing to go out there and, and start speaking to these unbelievers. Because God will catch you wherever you are and say, and now you're doing things my way. You know, God works through people. That's why we don't see God magically doing everything, you know, we want him to. I mean, God, if he really wanted to, could just appear right now and say, and now you're all believers, and everyone would be like, oh, heck yeah, we are. That or we're dead. But he doesn't. And he could. But what, what would that ultimately serve him as? To rule through fear or through ways like that? He starts people on the journey, but he doesn't force them to be on it. You know, he'll, he might give them a little shock. I've, I've certainly been punched in the face by God quite a few times for stupid things I've done. I'm probably one of the, if, if I compared my, my times punched in the face by God to everyone else in the Christian community, even non-Christian community, I can probably rank up pretty high up there, and I still get it now and again because I'm a stupid person. But... That doesn't go ahead and, you know, change the fact that you know, God is out there and you've got to be willing to to work with him and to start the process. You know, if you don't plow your fields, why should God send you rain? Because rain would do you nothing, no good. Plow your fields, get your crop in, and, and wait on God. Spirituality and fantasy. And this is where I take the cake. Being a fantasy writer, I'm certainly quite quite well versed in this. And actually I've I've seen quite a bit of things on this, and I'm going to clear up some of the stupid thoughts people have or misunderstandings. Fantasy noun. Imagination unrestricted by reality, meaning suspension of disbelief, which is a very fancy way of saying just because it doesn't happen here doesn't mean that it follows the same rules. At some point, you you have to suspend your your thoughts on this couldn't happen. So, oh well, in Lord of the Rings, you know, humans live to be really old, like a hundred or two hundred or some somewhere around there. 
in our real life, humans don't live that long. But we can accept that there because we know we're not working with our reality. We can also accept, you know, magic works there because we're not in our reality. If we were in our reality, then we'd say, well, that wouldn't work or things like that. Suspension of disbelief simply means not comparing it to taking it their word for it rather than saying well it won't work in reality or like star trek and warp fields you accept that warp fields works there are certain things you have to accept before you can get anywhere and suspension of disbelief simply asks that you accept certain things that and instead of, of being like well warp fields wouldn't work and that doesn't make sense instead of trying to find all the plot holes and be like and there's a plot hole there and a plot hole there Sometimes you just have to accept what they give you and say, all right, for the sake of the entire show, series, whatever, I accept it. Many Christian writers in the fantasy genre have used magic and talk about spirits within their book. Two people come to mind, Tolkien and Lewis, and I can toss in another person, John White, although most people probably won't know him. Um, all three write in a sort of an allegory. Tolkien is more of like really ambiguous allegory, um, but a lot of his stuff is based upon Catholicism. Um, I'm not going to go into that. But simply going to C.S. Lewis because he's my favorite, uh, I wouldn't say favorite author, but I would definitely say favorite uh, writer and apologist of the 20th century. He um, did a great job. He had magic and he had spirits, the, the deep magic and the witch's magic and all of that. And if you go and look up uh, jesusissavior.com, um, these people, they're obviously off their rockers. I don't even need to, to go. I, I could argue, you know, oh, I could say why they're off their rockers, but you can go view it for yourself. But they have this problem, and so does apparently other groups, have this problem with C.S. Lewis because he talks about magic, and he also talks about what? Oh, spirits. He's got Bacchus and Silenus and all of those. And they say, well, those are gods from other things. Of course, the and this is where suspension of disbelief comes. Because, you know, or at least a part of it. Because you have to accept that Narnia is an entirely different universe. It's not our universe. So just because someone's called Bacchus or Silenus doesn't mean they're the same Bacchus and Silenus we know them as. I mean, because in that world, they worship Aslan, who is Christ. He is the allegorical representation of Christ. And they worship him, meaning that they are not evil spirits who are trying to take control. They're not Satan. They're not the devil. They are just spirits. And, you know, why should we argue about, well, that's not possible or anything? Because you're you're trying to fit Narnia into our reality, which is never going to work because Narnia isn't our reality. So you can't just say, well, because, you know, if, if something's in Narnia, then it has to be absolutely equatable to this in our reality. So if it says Bacchus there, then it has to mean Bacchus here. If it says Silenus there, it has to mean Silenus here. If it's a satyr there, then it has to be a satyr here and this is evil here, therefore it must be evil there. But that's really, that's, that's destroying the entire creative liberty of creating your own world. I mean, if he was saying, and this happened in London, England, and stuff like this, then I'd say, well, yeah, you've, you've got to accept it, unless he's saying this is an alternate reality or something like that. If it's historical fiction or something like that, then yes, you know, we have, we have to accept that, but we're not. We're not being told it's historical fiction or anything like that. We are instead being asked to accept that there are certain things in Narnia which is different. And even I have magic in my book um, and my world. I have magic and elementalism and there is a great distinction between the two. And often this distinction in all things uh, if you look at it, is that one is that one is a natural innate ability given to people. It's not something they just, you know, learn. It's not something they had to learn or scholar about or anything like that. It's something they had. And that gave them the ability to do this. I mean, what do you think a 
uh, what do you think spiritual gift is? Now, obviously, it's it's something involving this. It's it's not just a something you gain over time. I mean, sometimes people gain it later, or they awaken to the fact they have it later. But it doesn't mean that you know you you didn't have to work to get it. And in the fact that I don't have to read books about spiritual gifts to be able to gain a spiritual gift because it's a gift. God gives it. He gives it freely. I don't get to choose which spiritual gifts I get. I don't get to take them. I don't get, you know, this isn't Pokemon where I get to start off picking one of three types of Pokemon. And if it's a special one, it, you know, if it's Pokemon Yellow, I get to choose Pikachu, no matter what. So obviously, you know, there's, there's a difference because magic in the form of reality is something you take by force. It's not something God gives you or hands to you who, or something you're born with. It's not birthright or anything like that. It's something you take for yourself. And that's often how magic is portrayed by these Christian writers is that it's not something that these aren't things that people are ought naturally had that they're just misusing, which, you know, you can you misuse your spiritual gifts as well. I mean, I have no doubt there's some people who do misuse their spiritual gifts. But these are things that people who had no spiritual gift or were unaware if they had one, they've never used it, and instead went and searched out the power of others. Which ultimately brings them back to Satan and the ultimate evil and so on and so forth. Is a fantasy world restricted to the same code of contact when it comes to spirituality? No, it's not, because it has its own code. You cannot apply the same laws of science to an entirely different world. Um, that's that's why Star Wars works. You know they've got, but all of these things that you know, honestly probably won't work in our reality. Um, the Force probably won't work in our reality, but we accept it because we know that it's not our reality. So you've got to accept some things when you come into a fantasy world. Oh, if it's not our reality, then you've got to accept that there's going to be some different things about it. So, how are you presenting the spirit slash supernatural within the story slash game itself? You know, are you presenting that there is good and evil, there's the innate ability, and then there's the power you take for yourself? Are you making differentiations between, or is it all one giant ambiguous power that everyone uses? And some people use it for good, and some people use it for bad, and oh well, it's just sort of amb giant ambiguity, and giant ambiguity, and whatever. Because in that case, people are going to not understand what you're trying to get at, and things aren't going to make sense. Spirituality and reality. Where do our creations push people towards? Where do they? Now, do we push do they push them towards God or do they push them towards Satan and magic and everything like that? Um I'm going to probably get some flag from people before saying this, but when uh when Harry Potter was first released um and became a big sensation, there was actually a jump in inquiries to um, different occult groups and groups, supernatural groups and things like that. There was a spike in it for kids wanting to learn how they could use magic. Um, and f for those of you who are like, well, this isn't true or anything, that's for you to argue. Um, you can say it's not true or anything, but I think it's a very, at least a logical thing because, let's face it, you get kids, um, you know, who read this stuff, and you're going to get a subset somewhere of people who want such power, because power power is very, very attractive, especially to people who don't feel like they have power. And often people who read books, um, other than for loving it, there's a, there's a good chance that people who read books as a matter of escape, just like games can be a matter of escape, or television. Reading books has been a way of escaping, and you know, let's look at what the characters are. Well, we've got Harry, 
who's in a bad life situation and people don't really like him. He's a character that people who don't have power can identify with. You know, he's not the guy everyone likes and, every, you know, the cool kid at school that everyone enjoys. He's the guy that's rejected and dejected in every facet of life except for the one where he's actually got some sort of power. And so you've got, you've got to understand that, you know, even, even if a lot of your readers or the readers of the books and watchers of the movies aren't people who feel dejected, there's a subset of people who do feel dejected and rejected by the world, and they sympathize with him. And do you know what they want to do? I want power. And I'm not going to say Harry Potter's of the devil or anything like that. I'm not going to say, oh, it was written by demons or things like that. I don't know. And I'm going to say that straight up front. I don't know. But I am going to say that, you know, it can lead people to these bad places. So do our creations produce a biblical perspective of reality? Does it? You know, is it sending a message towards, you know, does it show a world controlled by God or does it con show a world controlled by, by Satan? You know, does it show that power is for those who will reach out and take it? And then bring it to myself and use it for what I will. Or does it show that some people are born with power? And some people are not. And that we're all in a giant struggle against various evils and dark things. And that ultimately it's not about us. It's We are not the power we seek. The power we seek is greater and it does not belong to us. Is it a work of selfishness, or is it a work of service? Does my work glorify God or Satan? Whatever is not of God is of Satan, and what is not of Satan is of God. And you can't do one for the other. You can't glorify God while glorifying Satan. And you can't glorify Satan while glorifying God. You can't do things in God's name that ultimately are evil. And you can't do things in Satan's name that are ultimately good. Because God doesn't take evil and Satan doesn't take good. So, the, does it, I, I guess a better way of phrasing that would be, does it push people towards or away from God? Because that's ultimately where everything is. And some people will just naturally go away from God. And that's based upon who they are and their probably life's decisions outside of your reach. But still the question is asked. You know, where is it going, pushing people towards? 